you'll take your Bibles with me. Go to the book of Ephesians again. I think we've got about three more messages left in Ephesians. We're in Ephesians 6, picking up where we were last week. Ephesians 6, and we're going to start in verse 10 and read through verse 15, 10 through 15. Will you read along silently as I read aloud? It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, we know that in it is exactly what we need to hear for what we're facing today. Lord, it is the words of life. It's um, what gives us strength and victory. Lord, I pray that we would um, receive your help to put aside some distractions in our mind and focus in on a few moments around your word. Help me to teach it accurately, to apply it. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would apply it perfectly to every single heart that's here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're living in a time in God's redemptive story that we can call an already but not yet time. We feel, right? We know that we have been saved by grace, amen? We have eternal life. Are you with me this morning? We have this gift of eternal life, yet we also still live under the effects of the curse of sin. It's already, but, but not yet. It's, I, I have victory, but I still struggle, don't we? Are you with me? Do you struggle? We have victory. The scripture says, oh, death, where is thy victory? Kind of taunting death in that way. Oh, oh grave, where is thy sting? Uh, I, sorry, I said that backwards, but you get the idea. Right? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. He's triumphed over death. He's, he's taken back the sting of death, the, the force of sin. But we come to this verse here, these passages, and we read that there's still a battle going on. To me, that's a little confusing, right? We have victory, but we are to stand putting on the whole armor of God because there is a very real battle still raging. And if you're like me, which I hope you are, I think you are, you feel that. You know truth that I have victory in Christ, but you also know I've had failures this week, right? How do we rectify the difference and how do we approach this accurately? Today and tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day, don't we? And it's a day that's set aside as a memorial, as a remembrance of those who have given their lives for our country to enjoy freedoms that we have today that are not enjoyed everywhere else. And it's a reminder that there's, there's a lot more than just the comforts of life, isn't there? There's a lot more than just the barbecues and the picnics and uh, the, the day-to-day life that we enjoy that we kind of sometimes just take for granted, honestly. But behind those things that we enjoy and those freedoms that we take advantage of are are those who actually gave their lives, right? People who gave their lives whose names we'll never know about, they they died so that we could enjoy freedom. And it reminds us that there were some behind our freedoms that had to fight for their life. And I'm reminded when we come to Scripture this morning that sometimes to live we have to fight. To find that eternal life there needs to be a, a fight. There's a struggle sometimes. I'm seeing heads nod with me, and I'm grateful for that because, you know, the daily 
struggle that it is. I and mean, to say that there's a struggle is not a bad thing, right? To say that you struggle means that you're actually actively trying to fight against something. And yes, we have victory, but we know we need to continue to fight. To walk this eternal life, there's, there's one last portion that Paul's going to leave us with. He says, finally, brethren, he's, he's wrapping up his letter. We've been talking about the walk of a saint, how we're to walk in the light, we're to walk in the truth, we're to walk in, in love, we're to walk as, uh, uh, in submission, we're to walk filled with the Spirit. And now he says, finally, my brethren, to walk as a saint, to walk as a believer, you have to fight. You have to stand your ground and fight against those who are waging war against your soul. The believer must be engaged in purposeful and skilled combat. And in light of all that Paul has said, he ends by describing the Christian walk just as that, as a fight. In the Old Testament, victory in battle was a sign of blessing. Uh, for this reason, he told Joshua, God told Joshua to be strong and very courageous, right? Now that's a, a whole different level than what we put it today, because Joshua was about to wage war against the Canaanites, right? Those who occupied the promised land. And God said, be strong and courageous. He promised uh, courage to, to Gideon, right? Gideon was uh, very afraid of what God had told him to do, and and God instilled him with courage and ensured him a victory over his enemies. But in the New Testament, we turn the pages from physical fighting to now a, a spiritual war. We don't fight against flesh and blood anymore, do we? But we fight against spiritual wickedness. And the territory of the fight is in our very soul. It's in our heart. Just as he promised victory in the Old Testament to his saints, to those who would take conquest as he describes so God promises us victory today. We can still have victory. The story of Joshua is a, a New Testament picture of conquering the, the promised land. And in our soul, God promises us if we take Jesus Christ as our Savior, we can have the very same victory in our hearts. We can have victory over sin. We can have victory over bad habits. We can have victory over continually to go down that wrong path that we try to avoid, that we're, we're all prone to be sucked into, aren't we? God promises us victory, but the battle of our heart is where the battle is, is waged, is in our heart. Jesus, for this reason, said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks horrible things. Jesus said, no, 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 it's not, it's not uh, if you don't wash your hands right that you're going to be corrupted. So you're going to be corrupted by your own heart because that's where the battle is taking place. We don't fight with our fists against flesh and blood. We fight on our knees in the battle over our heart. For this reason, Scripture says, keep your heart with all diligence. Be, be determined to keep and to guard your heart because out of your heart come the issues of life. The things you say, the way you respond to people when you get a little irritated, right? The habits that we form that don't please the Lord, they come out of our heart. And every wrong outcome, every, every issue of our life is rooted in the heart. The abundance of the heart is what makes up your life. So church, we have to see that the battle is being waged in our hearts. And can I say this and warn you? Passivity in this kind of a war, is not an option. The war is being fought on the battlefield of your heart. You cannot just say, I'll, um, I'll be a neutral party in this war. I'll bow this one out for a moment. To be passive in this kind of a war means that you will be defeated. Satan is fighting against you. He is actively fighting. He takes no vacation. There's no ceasefire with, with Satan. It is an ongoing, continual fight. We're all enlisted. And maybe you're like me, and you've, you've had little to no instruction to how to fight spiritually. Because we live in the physical world, right? And we don't know how to actually fight in the spiritual realm. It's not hard work. It's not strategy. It's not determination. It's not grits and dedication. It's a different fight. So how do we fight this spiritual war? Scripture tells us from Ephesians 6, there's really three steps. 
first of all, it's this. This is going to seem almost too simple and a little counterintuitive, but the first step is to submit to God's strength. To submit to God's strength. Listen to Isaiah 40 in this light. Isaiah 40 says this. I'm sure you've seen this printed on posters and you've read this verse many times. It says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and fall away and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and they will not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. To me, that, if you think about it, all right, we're all Christians, and we, we've heard these verses before, so we wouldn't deny the truth of that verse, would we? But to me, those verses don't really make a lot of sense. The youth shall not faint. If I am weak, then God is going to renew my strength. If I wait on the Lord, I'm going to get powerful. I don't think that way, do I? I, I think I've got to do something to earn it. I've got I've to really dig deeper, and I've got to try harder, and I've got to really just be stronger so that I can win the battle. We're conditioned to think if I work harder, if I strategize better, if I maybe read more books, or if I, um, if I read my Bible in a year, then I'll hit success. But you know what I found out? When I try harder, I still fail because I'm putting on my strength. Somehow, time and time again, when I read Scripture, the ones who received God's strength were the ones who were the weakest. The ones who were endued with God's power were the ones who couldn't actually do it without God's power, right? Remember Moses? He was a weak person, wasn't he? He couldn't even speak properly, he said. He had already killed someone, he'd murdered someone, and he was kind of hiding for his life, and God, Moses said, I I beg you, just send someone else to do this. But God used him. Scripture's filled with people, church, that couldn't do it, they didn't have the strength, they didn't have the ability, but God gave it to them. It almost seems counterintuitive, doesn't it, to say fighting involves first submitting? But we have to understand where the battle is being waged to understand why this is so important. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. The the battle is in the spiritual realm. This means the battle is fought in our heart. Scripture says that our heart is the seat of our emotions, our thoughts, our decisions, our beliefs. This is what our heart is. It's a place where a person believes and trusts in Christ, right? And Jesus Christ comes and resides their heart, their being. It's the whole of who you are. Your soul, this is where the battle is being fought. And this is where the battle lies. Because in our heart, the Holy Spirit indwells us as believers. But in our heart also we have a flesh. And that's where the battle is. Because we want to do wrong, don't we? But we also, we want to do right. Are you with me? I want to be better, and I want to, I want to please God ultimately. But man, I really like to sin. I like to indulge in my flesh. It feels good for a minute. This is where the battle is. This is why we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. In other words, we don't make it easy for our flesh to give in. We put on Jesus Christ. Paul said this. I hope you can relate with Paul with me. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm wretched, he said. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death, this flesh? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so that with my mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin, my heart wants to do right, it wants to do wrong, and there's this battle raging and it's just exploding in me. Lord, I'm so wretched, deliver me from myself, he said. The battle lies within us. This is the already, not yet I'm talking about. Our hearts possess the power of the Spirit and the pull of the flesh. And that's why we come to verse 10 and it says, look at verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't put on your armor. Don't rely on your strength. Our submission places trust in in the source of our strength, not in the power and the demise of our flesh. Romans 7, 18 says, I know that is in me dwelleth no good thing. 
Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Paul was desperate. He said, who shall deliver me from this? He said, I am the chief of sinners. Paul said that. John Newton said the same thing in Amazing Grace when he wrote it. He said, oh, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound to save a wretch like me. But it's God's grace that saves us. All right, if you have a flesh like I do that wants to do right and please God, a spirit, but the flesh that wants to do wrong, you know what it's like. It's kind of like what I've experienced cleaning a house with a toddler. You ever tried to do that before? You clean up, you're putting things away, and who's behind you? <laughs> Taking those things right off the shelf and putting them back on the floor. Oh, isn't that frustrating? If you've never experienced that, you're welcome. Uh, you're not missing much, right? It's almost like you have someone living on the inside that's actively working against you, is the idea, right? I want to put things back in order. I want to do things that are orderly and right. But there's this little human doing the opposite. And our flesh is that way, because our spirit wants to please God. Lord, I want to be more like you. I know that these habits that I'm, I'm living in, I know that the way I'm speaking to my spouse or the way I'm, I'm raising my kids, I know it's not always honoring you, Lord, but I want to I be like you. But the temptation is, is strong. The enticing pulls at our desires, and we, we want to give in at the same time, and there's this, this battle. That's why fighting harder doesn't accomplish anything. It's just further enslavement. There's a pastor whose name is Ted Roberts. He's a pastor and a counselor. He told a story that when he was in the Marine Corps, he was scuba diving, scuba diving and exploring underwater caves with some fellow friends at a, at a cookout, just kind of having a day off. And they would put on scuba gear and go underwater into underwater caves. And they would find passages there. And then they'd even find a place where there would be an air pocket that they could take their scuba gear off inside the cave. That sounds terrifying to me. That sounds so claustrophobic. But they were enjoying that. Well, they were all done scuba diving. And Ted Roberts, he said, I was a pretty macho, tough guy. So when everyone went over to the cookout, I said, you know, let me try to swim back into that air pocket. But let me see if I can do it without any scuba gear. I can hold my breath long enough, find my way back, find that air pocket, get a breath, and I can go back, no problem. I'll show them, you know. So he did it. He held his breath. He got the biggest breath he could. He swam by memory through the chasms. And when he went up into that air pocket, he realized that the pocket had shrunk. He grasped, he got the, the, as much air he could, right? And the pocket collapsed when he took all the air out of it. He went back as fast as he could. Now he's starting to panic, like, like you are right now, <laughs> right? And he, he tried to swim quickly. He found, he saw the light where he could get to the, to the surface and get that gasp of air that he needed so badly. But on his way to the surface, to attach to his leg was a knife. And there was a little bit of a, a buoy to signal where the cave was. And as he was going up, his knife caught on the rope that the buoy was attached to. And he was, man, he thought, my life is over. I'm stuck here, I've got no strength left. So what did he do? The same thing you would do. He pulled as hard as he could. He pulled and pulled and pulled, but he realized that the more he pulled, the more he tried to get to the surface, the tighter that knot became. And then, in a final last-ditch effort, he decided to relax. He looked down, he grabbed his knife, and he cut the rope and burst to the surface and got that that gas of air that he needed so badly. He was so depleted of oxygen that he got to the shore and, and passed out. Obviously, he lived to tell the story, right? He realized that trying harder only made the situation worse. Trying harder just made it tighter. Trying harder was like pulling against a noose that just made it tighter and tighter and tighter. And it wasn't until he relinquished his strength, stopped, and used some thought that it saved his life. Hey, Paul's been spending this whole letter explaining to them the power of God that they have. 
he said in chapter 1. He says, I don't cease in giving mention to you in my prayers that you would know the exceeding greatness of His power. He said in the next chapter, chapter 3, He said, to the intent, God's grace is to show principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God. We have the power of God at our disposal, church. Cannot be accessed within ourselves, though. Only from the power that's available to us as we surrender to it. The power that we have available to us is the same power that raised Christ from the grave. We should be able to walk in freedom. But the problem is we are so stubborn to use our strength. Do you say, Pastor, I don't understand. How do I surrender to God's power over my power? I think it's a change from what we do to why we do it. Instead of praying out of performance, i got to pray We pray because we need it. Lord, I I need you. I need you to fill my soul. Instead of worshiping in church on a Sunday because it's expected, and someone's going to give me a call and say, where were you? I better show up. We worship and we participate in this because our souls crave corporate worship and we need it. Instead of reading our Bibles out of duty, we, we breathe and live the Word of God because it's the very life source of our spirit. This is our surrender. We surrender to say, it's not about what I do, but it's why I do it. And I need God's Word. I need, I need God alone to fill my empty soul because my strength is all gone. It's nothing. That's why Paul said, out of desperation, that I just might know him, he said, in the power of his resurrection. If I could just be made conformable unto his death. Paul says, I don't care what I've done. I don't care what I, what I could say in my pedigree. All I know is I need to know God's power. And this caused total surrender. This is a spirit of submission that allowed Paul to say, when I am, stre- when I am in weakness, then he is made strong. Therefore, I glory in infirmities. I I am glad when I'm weak. I'm glad when I get sick or when I get discouraged or when I get cast down because it reminds me that my strength is nothing anyways. And it forces me to rely on God. The hymn writer said, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the rock of ages. My weakness makes Christ stronger in my life. My strength pushes back in His strength but my surrender makes way to His. Hey, listen, your victory has nothing to do with your success, your performance, your perfection. The fruit of your works is death, church. I remember back in, um, I think it was like 2008, we, we used to love to watch the Olympics. I think it was in 2008, Michael Phelps won eight gold medals in a row in one Olympic season. It was an amazing feat. And I heard about his, his workout routine, his training regimen. It was incredible. He would swim about eight miles a day in training. Eight miles a day. Some of us don't even drive that far to work, right? That's how much he's swimming a day. Um, if you've ever swum a lap in a pool, you know that's hard. <laughs> it, it will wind you really quickly. His training was a, a meticulous order of drills, bursts of speed, focused work on his weaknesses and his strength to keep him focused in a finely tuned machine. I mean, he spent years preparing for a feat like that. His diet was affected. His, his sleep was affected. Everything was about what he would do to win that gold medal, right? Can you imagine him winning those gold medals? And then he allowed someone else to stand on the podium and receive those medals for him. Can you imagine someone like that doing that? wouldn't make any sense, would it? Why? Because he did the work. He did the training. He did the, the true strength was in his training, in what he did. Well, God will surely not share his glory with someone else. It's God who got the victory for us. God sent his son, and his son lived a perfect, sinless life. His son was nailed to a cross and took our sins, and he rose again with his power. So we submit to God's strength. 
It's His strength alone. But how else do we fight spiritually? We've got to submit to God's strength first. We've got to relinquish our own strength. But secondly, we need to survey the battlefield. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles means his traps or his deceptions. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that's humans, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all, to stand. In the days leading up to Operation D-Day, the Allies launched something called Operation Fortitude. It was a complex plan to deceive and mislead the Germans about when and where they would attack. It involved um, using a variety of tactics, a fake military unit, manipulating radio traffic, employing double agents. While there were initial disagreements to the plan's approach and how it would happen, the Allies ultimately focused on making the Pass de Calais region appear to be the target of major invasion. So this deception played a significant role in the success of the D-Day landings. The Allies actually convinced the Germans that they'd be attacking somewhere else. And of course, knowing when and where the enemy attacks has a huge role in how the battle will be played out, won't it? As believers, we cannot be fooled into thinking that Satan's ways and his, his battle plan is deceived or it's, it's, it's covered. We know, we can know exactly what Satan is doing against us. His ways have been exposed. In 2007, the NFL was overtaken by what they call Spygate. The New England Patriots, led by coach Bill Belichick, were caught videotaping the opposing team's coaches to know what kind of signals they would use so that they could have an advantage on the field. The NFL heavily fined and penalized the New England Patriots. And of course, knowing what the other team is going to do is going to give you an advantage. And so that's why Paul gives us the battlefield. He shares exactly what Satan is going to do against us. And you know, Satan's ways have not changed. Ever since the Garden of Eden, and ever since the fact that he lured Eve from her desires, it mirrors exactly what happened in 1 John 2, what he says there, the lust of the flesh, the, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And it mirrors exactly how Satan tempted Jesus Christ in the wilderness. He lured him the same way. So we can know what the devil is going to do. Here's part of what he's doing against us. Here's the battlefield. Look at the, first of all, it's the devil's schemes. The devil's schemes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is important. Because somehow we can forget that we, one another, are not the enemies, right? We can feel like the real fight is actually with flesh and blood. So Paul reminds us, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If we did, we might have a chance because we're kind of on equal footing there. But what he's telling us is you don't have a chance. You don't fight against mere mortals. You fight against spiritual wickedness in high places, he says. Let's face it. There are good fights and there are bad fights, aren't there? That's why Paul told Timothy, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Because there's a good fight and there's a bad fight. Bad fight is the ones that we employ against each other. And we forget who the real enemy is, don't we? And Satan is a coward. He will use people to hurt people and hide behind people. So we attack other people. But our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our battle is against the real enemy behind that deception. Paul had to put a stop to fighting church members in Philippi, remember? He said, I beseech Iodias and Syntyche, be of the same mind, stop fighting. But there's also a good fight. And that's why Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith. 
There is a good fight to be had, church. There is a good fight to defend what is truth and honorable. There is a good fight to stand our ground and say, hey, this is wrong and this is right, and I'm going to stand up for that and I'll fight for it. But it's a bad fight when we're fighting each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. A kind of civil war within the church. It's good to remember who the enemy is. There's an analogy that's spread online recently. Whether it's true or not, I'm not really sure, but it paints a good picture. Maybe you've seen it before. There's this illustration of a jar with black ants and red ants in them. And they say, well, the, the ants can move around in the jar perfectly peaceful. When someone starts shaking the jar, they start to fight each other. Sometimes we've got to remember that Satan is the one shaking the jar. We're not to fight one another. Flesh and blood is God's, one of God's greatest gifts to us. Is that we're made in the image of God to bless and to love each other. We receive God's grace from each other. Flesh and blood receive strength and encouragement when they sit over a cup of coffee and, and pray over things that are going on. Flesh and blood, they give physical aid when someone's maybe moving across town. They, they give, a, give a hand. Flesh and blood stays up late praying for their friends. Flesh and blood raise their children and pass on their faith. Flesh and blood are not our enemies. We don't fight against each other. So we're to take up God's armor because his strategies are deceptive. The wiles of the devil make us think that sometimes we are fighting against each other when we're really fighting against Secondly, the devil's soldiers. Who are the devil's soldiers? Well, they're identified as principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's the same forces that were at work when that man, the maniac of Gadara, was chained because they were infiltrating his body and spirit. And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many this is a great power that is stronger than us, right? We have no match against spiritual forces. We should not scare you. It should cause you to run to the Lord. Because the Lord has had victory over these forces. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities or powers can separate us from the love of God. Christ has proven victory over spiritual powers. It says in Colossians 2, he has spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Christ has gone unto heaven. He's at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers are subject to him. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these powers. It's a wrestle. This is not a a long-range combat. Wrestling is a close, intimate combat. And they're fighting with us every day, but Christ has proven victorious over it. So third of all, we see the devil's standoff. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. We know that in the last days, and last times, which we may live in, we're not sure if this is it or not, right? We don't know if this is the last days, but in the last days, there's a final push against Satan to put maximum pressure on God's people, but we take on the armor of God so that we can withstand it. But last of all, what do we do to fight this spiritual battle? We stand against the attack. How do we stand against the attack? Well, Scripture says we do that by putting on the armor of God. We'll look at the first three this morning. First of all, there is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Look at verse number 14. It says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with the truth. Now a soldier first was told to tightly tie a belt around his waist. At first that might seem like an interesting or curious addition or first step for a soldier's ensemble. But a belt was a crucial centerpiece of everything he did. See, from the belt would hold his breastplate in place. It would hold the rest of his clothes and armor in place. From his belt, would he put his dagger and sword to hang on? On his belt, he would hang his shield that he could take and 
quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And so without this belt, the soldier would have nowhere to put his tools for fighting. The soldier would have nothing to hold together the rest of his armor that would shield against the unsuspecting blow or the one that he sees coming. The belt held it all together, and it is the truth that holds the believer together. In one piece, from truth comes all else. And this is a reasonable start to the armor, considering that one of Satan's chief goals is to distort the truth, is to deceive us into thinking that what is false is right. What is right is actually false. We're reading the book of Ephesians, and Paul told this very church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he says, when I leave, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4 he said, speak the truth in love. Build each other up in the truth. Constantly remind each other what is truth. Constantly take each other to the word of God. Constantly pour your heart into the word of God and make sure that what God's word is saying informs the way you are living. That's why truth is so important. Are you standing with the truth cinched about yourself tightly? How often do we find ourselves spending time in God's word? as opposed to spending time on YouTube or television or other very important tasks. If these important tasks take away from us knowing the truth, they're not important anymore, are they? We are to fight the battlefield of our soul using the truth of the Word of God. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. Being with your church is part of your commitment to the truth. But ultimately, how is your relationship with the one who is truth? John 1.1 1, 1 says the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us. The word of God, Jesus Christ, he is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. More importantly than even just committing to reading the Word of God, how is your relationship with the One who is truth? Are you drawing closer to Jesus Christ? Are you developing your walk with Him and your talk with Him? Are you learning how to pray? Are you learning how to please Him? Are you learning how to obey Him? Are you learning who He is and what He likes and how to grow in His grace? That's why Paul said, above all else, that I might know Him that I might just get to know Jesus Christ better because He is truth. And I need truth more than anything else. Secondly, there's the breastplate of righteousness. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, the soldier's breastplate was a coverall for his internal organs, his vital organs. And it was not to be used at specific times like a shield, but it was there at all times to protect an unsuspected blow from the enemy. And I'm telling you, Without the breastplate of righteousness as a Christian, we are prone to an unsuspected, fatal blow from the enemy. Well, what is righteousness? What, is, what really is righteousness? The Bible says there's none righteous, right? No, not one. So to me, that sounds like I'm in trouble. I can't have a breastplate of righteousness. If I read Scripture, it says there's none righteous. No, not one. The Word of God tells us very clearly, the book of Psalms says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth no iniquity. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall come past him about. So the Bible tells me that I am wicked, I am false, I am wrong, I am by nature unrighteous, aren't I? I can't do what's right. But blessed is the man whom the Lord doesn't impute that unrighteousness upon which means it's not about what I've done, but it's about what someone else has done for me. Blessed is the man who trusteth in the Lord. The Word of God says that He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So unrighteousness is what I do, and righteousness is what Christ does. So to have the breastplate of righteousness means that I have put trust in Jesus Christ for my eternal life. And there's no blow from the enemy that can knock me out, right? 
there's no way that God will ever give up on me because it's based on His perfect work on the cross. And I can't believe that I would ever stray so far away that God would say, I'm done with Him because we contain the breastplate of righteousness. That's why we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't put on ourselves. Today, if you're trusting in your works, if you're trusting in something you've done or a family that you're part of or even a church that you attend or are members of, if you're trusting what you've done, you have no breastplate of righteousness. And the blow from an enemy will be fatal and final. I challenge you to trust in Jesus Christ's righteousness alone. But the gift of God is non-condemnation. Remember the woman caught in adultery? The Pharisees wanted to stone her. But Jesus Christ said, I forgive your sins. Go and sin no more. His first move was not to condemn that woman. And we can come to Christ and know, Lord, I have your righteousness. It's not based on my works. That doesn't make me want to sin more. It makes me want to please you more. And I know I can never be harmed by Satan because I have Jesus Christ's righteousness. Be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But last of all, we should have on the boots of peace. The boots of peace. You say, well, it says shoes. I know, but I wanted to be alliterated, okay? Is that, is that all right? But the soldier often will wear boots. It was a, a leather, kind of a, a strap on your, on your foot that had a leather strap that would go around your leg. It looked kind of like a boot. It says in verse 15, your feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shod meaning fitted out. Often a soldier's boots would have spikes on the bottom to stick into the ground to hold your ground. It could also be used as a weapon against the enemy. So our feet give us sure and steady footing as the onslaught of Satan comes at us. It is an active thing, right? I mean, we are in a battle constantly. So we have on, ironically, Paul says, the gospel of peace. This is weird, right? Because we're in a time of war, aren't we? This is fighting the battle. This is fighting the spiritual warfare. He says, be ready to share the gospel of peace. Because we do have peace, don't we? We have peace three ways. Peace with God. You know, once we were enemies with God. And if you read the Old Testament, read the Bible, I guess, itself, you don't want to be an enemy with God. God always wins. Right? He's more powerful than anybody. He created us. We were once at enmity with God, but the gospel of peace made us reconciled to God. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But the gospel of peace is also peace with one another. You know, the gospel brings brother and sister together. Those who were once enemies, he brings together as one. There's a woman named Elizabeth Elliot. She was married to Jim Elliot, who was missionary partners with Nate Saint and others who were sent to Ecuador. They wanted to reach the Aka tribe of Ecuador. And this tribe was notorious for being brutal against outsiders. They had never been reached before by anyone outside their tribe. These four missionary men took some months to reach out to this tribe, and they finally decided to land a plane on the banks of a river to try to introduce themselves and ultimately win them to Christ. And all four men were brutally murdered by that tribe. Elizabeth Elliot writes in her book, Through Gates of Splendor, that eventually those men who murdered her husband became believers and are now close friends with her. That's amazing. I cannot comprehend that kind of reconciliation, but the gospel is the gospel of peace. The gospel brings peace. Kim Fuke was the girl in the picture, or the, the napalm girl. You've probably seen a picture from the war in Vietnam of a woman, a small girl, who had just been severely burned by a napalm dropped by the South Vietnamese. She survived the attack and later accepted Christ. And later, 
She found peace with her attackers and learned to forgive them. Injuries that they left her leave her back still hard as a rock today. But she found out how to forgive her enemies. It's the gospel of peace. Our feet are to be prepared with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means the readiness. We got to be ready. We got to be ready to share to brother and sister and to the lost alike what the gospel has done to our heart. And this is how we fight. We fight violence and we fight attacks with peace. But the gospel also brings us peace in our hearts. The word of God says that our hearts can condemn us. Have you felt that before? My heart can condemn me. But the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gospel of peace gives us peace in our hearts. Lord, I know you don't desire to condemn me. You've given me the gift of life. And this gives you strength in the battle. From 19, sorry, ni- not 19, from 1774 to 2004, the starting of our nation to today, the Department of Veteran Affairs estimates that over 41.9 million men and women have served in battles and wars of our country. And of those 42 million people, 1.2 million have died during conflict. 1.2 million people. We certainly owe a lot, don't we, to those who've died for our freedoms, for our rights that we have. Just one of those men was Jerry Vance. I can remember my grandfather, who served in Vietnam, going to the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is a large black marble wall. It has inscribed every single name of those who died in that war. And my grandfather went and found Jerry Vance's name, who was his close friend in Vietnam, who died in that war. He died serving his country. It was very real to my grandfather. In the battle against Satan, there's also been many deaths, haven't there? We probably all know way too many of those who have died at the hands of the devil's onslaught and will never face an eternity with Christ. You know, our enemy walks around like a lion seeking whom he could devour. He wants to destroy us. But to survive the war, there requires a different kind of death, and that's the voluntary death of yourself. See, Christ said, If anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a death of knowing I'm not all that. I have no strength within me. I don't have the answers. I don't have the ability, the skill. Lord, I'm weak. Would you show me your strength in my weakness? This requires a total surrender of our abilities to recognize that the victory is already won. It's won by Christ, and is lost when we try to fight in our strength. It causes us to lean wholly on the Lord. When we trust in the Lord with all of our might, we lean not into our own understanding. In all our ways, we acknowledge Him. For we put on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh. Let's ask the Lord to remind us of our weakness and the strength that can be found in it through the power that he has won on the cross. Lord, we thank you that there's victory in the cross. We thank you that there's great power that you have. But Lord, we're so stricken by our own flesh that we want to be enticed by our desires. We want to have the victory. Lord, it's pride. Let us release that pride and fall squarely on you for your strength and what we need. I pray that if there's one here today who's never received the victory in Christ because they've never asked you to be their personal Savior, would this be the day? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.